Hi, everyone. Welcome to Forbes Talks. I'm Diane Brady, and I am with Maggie McGrath, who is editor of Forbes Women. And Maggie, we are talking about uh, certainly not the trial this century, but one we've paid a lot of attention to, Elizabeth Holmes, Theranos, off to prison. Um, Let's just talk, first of all, about the context of who was this woman? She was a startup founder. And like so many other startup founders, she dropped out of Stanford at the age of 19 to build a company. Like so many other founders, she adopted a fake it till you make it ethos and attracted a ton of money from very powerful people, including Henry Kissinger and Rupert Murdoch. And at the height of her heyday in 2015, she had an on paper net worth of $4.5 billion because of how many people who, who had invested in her blood testing startup. Unfortunately, that startup was found to be fraudulent, and she was charged with uh, four guilty counts in her trial earlier this year and was just sentenced to 11.25 years in prison, which I think was stunning for her. There are reports, this is an alleged statement from her, that she once said, they don't put pretty people like me in jail. And I think what we see is, you know, justice has come for her. Well, and I think let's let's go to the pretty people like me, because one of the things, having met her, she was a self-made woman in, in many senses. The word she got a lot of attention, many magazine covers. I mean, the whole issue of gender, it was something she was very aware of when you look even during the trial at the extent to which she was consciously both going to type, going against type. What was your take? Because you've covered so many women entrepreneurs over the years. Well, I female entrepreneurs are unfortunately rare rarer than they should be in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. We see lower levels of funding by by many, many factors, right? Like women get 2% of all venture funding. So when you see a woman in the tech space, getting that much venture funding, getting that much attention, the cycle kind of feeds into itself. And she's feeding into that by saying, you know, I'm going to wear the black turtleneck. I'm going to lower my voice. I'm going to present as powerful woman. Um, So I think she received an outsized degree of attention because of her gender. And then fast forward to the trial, you know, she alleged that she was raped when she was at Stanford, that her former partner, Suni Bawani, had kind of coerced her and exerted control over her. I I don't want to say playing the victim, but she's aware of her gender by invoking those charges. You know, one of the most poignant parts of the trial was where she had this list of when she'd, you know, wake up, thank God, do yoga. But it reminded me a little bit of this movie, Michael Clayton, where Tilda Swinton's in the mirror going, <clears throat> shake hands, look firm, look people in their eye, the eye. Like, there was this very much that she was trying to play to a certain um, myth and stereotype that I think a lot of women really feel pressure to do when they're in the boardroom, when they're asking for money. And that doesn't exonerate her, but... Did that strike you? I know it's something you looked at during the trial. You know, the degree to which she really was fabricating an image for herself? Well, I thought it was interesting to see how she presented herself during the trial versus how we saw her present herself in the years that she was running Theranos, right? She always had stick straight hair, really severe makeup, and again, the black turtleneck. For the trial, I don't know her natural hair texture, but it's been curlier. It's been looser. It's been lighter. Softer. She has one year old child, and now she's pregnant with another child. Um, And no one, uh, I don't think she has said exactly how far along she is, but I've seen court reporters who were there last week for the sentencing saying she looks to be six to seven months pregnant. So she is visibly pregnant. So that invokes all the ethos of being a mother and maternal and all those typically good, warm feelings. And so it's been really interesting to see the image that she's presenting in the court versus the image that she was presenting, you know, six, seven years ago. It's been fascinating to look at the reaction to this. And it, there's a term that's come up that I've last heard during the Martha Stewart trial. Is it schadenfreude, I think, is is that's a term I've heard you now used with Theranos. Do, do, when you look at the coverage and the reaction um, to the sentencing, what have you seen? So she faced up to 20 years in prison, and uh, her her legal team had requested that she only spend 18 months in prison and spend the rest of the time in some combination of 
home confinement and community service. Prosecutors were seeking 15 years and what came out was 11.25. I, I think the reaction I've seen is mostly surprise. You know, she submitted, uh, her legal team submitted 130 letters of support, including notably and confusingly uh, Senator Cory Booker. <laughs> so you had a lot of people testifying that, you know, she was just trying to build a company and, she was over promising on the technology, but she's not personally profited from anything. You don't see her on a yacht in the south of France or any sort of overt show of, of rich, right? But I, I think the reactions I have seen have been kind of interesting. You have people who were surprised that she got that much because I think, unfortunately, where we are in this news cycle of the last six years we're not always used to seeing justice delivered in mm -hmm. in the way that one might expect um i've seen other people scolding people for being surprised and other people also scolding people for saying that because she's pregnant she should get a softer term um, i've seen a lot of um activists pointing out that many pregnant people are sentenced to prison every year and the color of her skin and the prominence of her case makes her no different than those people. So if we are to talk about pregnant people who are incarcerated, we should have a broader conversation. So I've seen the conversations kind of run the gamut from examining the incarceration system to what it means for Elizabeth Holmes exactly to I've also seen some interesting comparisons about where her case ranks among white collar criminals and the message this case sends to other startup founders. Well, and, and she has been vilified for her pregnancy, two pregnancies. And, you know, when you know you're heading to jail and you become pregnant, you know, that can cause criticism or it can say, hey, you know, when she gets out, her fertile years will <clears throat> probably be behind her. But um what you know when you when you look at it in the context of women you know and and the penal system but let's just take uh when we've looked at other women criminals i've looked at uh, martha stewart's one i mentioned any context is there any differences does gender really play a role you see in in how maybe not necessarily people are sentenced but the reaction and the attention we give cases like this so there's a smaller sample size among white collar criminals. Uh, the Wall Street Journal took an interesting analysis here and looked at 16 female offenders compared to 143 male offenders. So, so we're averaging very different numbers. Um, but this analysis showed that women who are sentenced for white collar crimes receive about half the sentence that men receive. Now, looking at a ranking of some of the most prominent white collar fraud cases, Bernie Madoff is at the top with 150 years. Elizabeth Holmes kind of falls in the sweet spot there. I mean, I, on this list, and that includes the president of Enron and other prominent uh, fraud cases, Worldcon, um, you do have Martha Stewart, she's at the very bottom. So she does not rank in, in the middle. Well, it's she's insider trading too. But, you know, 11 years is kind of in that sweet spot. I'm seeing 10 years, 12 years, 12, 12 years, seven months, 14 years. What do you think the judge was trying to do here? I, I think the judge was trying to make a statement to other founders, other startup founders, that you can't just invent data. You can't just have a product that doesn't work, but continue to bill it as if it does work. Um, this is, I think, putting a stake in the ground. So one other question, Maggie, which is I think that um, because there are so few women in these realms, they do become both symbols and, and sort of these, uh, you know, very polarizing and what impact has this had, the case in general, in terms of other women in Silicon Valley? And have you detected any reaction? Because it's hard enough to get money, you know, when you're going in to get VC funding, to get support. Has there been a ripple effect of Elizabeth Holmes in terms of what other, you know, prominent female entrepreneurs are saying with regard to the reaction they get? I have two answers there. One is we started to pull the data last year around the occasion of the trial to see if there was a chilling effect. And unfortunately, women get such a small percentage of the pie of venture funding that it's just small numbers on top of small numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to establish causation. I've heard from some founders in the tech space, right? Because if you're running a, a retail company, if you are like a birdies or uh, 
a rent the runway, for instance, it's a fundamentally different business than a blood testing company. So I also think you're not going to see the effect across founders in all sectors. You kind of have to zero in on healthcare specifically. And I've heard from some founders about increased due diligence from investors, you know, extra questions, a little bit of a hesitation, but it's it's it wasn't bearing out in the numbers that we pulled last year. But again, it's hard to establish causation and correlation when you're already dealing with systemic macroeconomic issues, systemic gender inequality issues. So I I don't want to say anything. Definitive. And the hype cycle, right? I mean, part of what you do in, in Silicon Valley and elsewhere is you're supposed to be pumping up the potential, but obviously not to the point of, you know, what's essentially systemic fraud and uh, advertising a technology that does not exist and frankly selling it. So that's that's what I think is fascinating is the degree to which nobody really checked. Nobody. But that also, the hype cycle gets to the other point that I hear from female founders. Um, I wrote a story earlier this year uh, about the end of the girl boss era, right? We've seen a number of prominent female CEOs step down from their from the company that they founded. And these were some women who had been tagged as girl boss. Now, a lot of these founders worked in the consumer space. So they are selling a product often to a predominantly female customer base. So by making themselves the face of the company or in doing the promotion cycle to get the investment dollars that they need, they become the face of the company, right? I heard from some founders saying they didn't want to become the face of the company, but you know, to sell makeup, to sell clothes, it's kind of what you had to do. You establish you have a platform. The bigger the platform you have, the more investors will trust you. And it just is a vicious cycle, or in some cases, a virtuous cycle, right? Where you get the money. But I think in this case, Elizabeth Holmes became the face of her company and became one of the rarefied female founders in the media space who then she committed fraud. And then other people might say, hey, the media is picking on female founders, but I don't think that in reporting fraud, we are picking on a female founder so much as reporting the fraud. Yeah. It just so happens that she is part of a very small percentage of female founders who get money. You grab our attention on the way up, we're going to continue paying attention on the way down, right? That's a much more succinct way of saying what I just said. Not at all. Thanks very much, Maggie.